All right, Cherubs, thanks for joining me once again. I'm told that repetition is the best way to encourage education, learning. So let's go over this again, shall we? Let's deal with another clown saying calories in, calories out, though. This time it's quite a high profile clown. It's Neil. Unbelievable. A physicist who can't get this right. And I know this is a short edited video. This is a minute long. And I know that not everything he said is in it. But he says enough in this video for us to go, Neil, not so much. All right. So let's hear it. So you eat food that has, you look at the calorie content. Why would you do that? Calorie content is also not quite correct, Neil, because the only way to get calories out of something is to release them. Does that mean they were contained in there beforehand? Given that they're photons and nothing else, they can be drawn out of the field, can't they? Existence also is, you know, seems to leave us under the assumption that there's mass involved and photons don't have any rest mass, Neil. You're a physicist, aren't you? So no, food doesn't contain calories. Calories can be evolved is a better word, but calories are photons and nothing else. Specifically, by definition, by measurement, that's what calories are by way of what is phenomenologically behind the observation that the temperature of a water bath of a given volume changes by a given amount in degrees Celsius. Well, it's photons with no mass, so they weren't in there in the first place. They are released to entropy when they are burned suddenly under a large electrical stimulus in a piece of kit called a bomb calorimeter. What that does is gives us an estimate, a piss poor estimate at best, of how much effective work capacity a person can evolve from the intake of a given bolus of food in the form of mass, Neil. A loose estimate at best. So Neil's about to say, measure your calories in. Well, great. How do you do that, Neil? Let's start at the very most first principles here in terms of counting calories, at least. First of all, you have to take the calories in a given food substance estimated on the label. Why do I say estimated? Well, Neil, it's because it's allowed to be more than 20% out, plus or minus, legally, in most countries. So you're not going to count your calories. You cannot count your calories right there, because you can't get close. What about the thermic effect of food, Neil? Is that figured in your calculations of calories in, calories out? If it is, great. Why don't you explain to us at home how we do that at home? Good luck. <laughs> uh, what about the fact that protein, Neil, usually is not oxidized for energy and as such becomes incorporated mostly into body structures in some way and as such effectively, therefore, provided no calories to speak of? Yet, the label says four kilocalories per gram for protein, which again is allowed to be 20% out. So no, Neil, you're not going to count your calories consumed. For a start, how do you consume something that has no rest mass and cannot therefore be bought to rest? Neil, how does that work? The short version for people who don't know what the hell I've been talking about. Here it is. Calories are an estimate of the effective work capacity derivable physiologically by a human being having consumed some food containing the so-called calories, so-called loose estimate. So how do you use this to predictably change your body composition, lose fat? Well, you have to vastly grossly undercut your food intake by the so-called 500 K calories or more per day for a nice steady loss of fat, which is great until you understand that undercutting your food intake by that amount of mass, which is what's actually important here, you are predisposing yourself quite likely to some secondary problems associated with that. So an attempt to alter your body composition using the calorie is poor practice. It's a bad idea. It's contraindicated, Neil. It's stupid in the extreme. As Neil is talking outside your lane of expertise, while you may be an expert in physics, you are not an expert in human physiology, the energetics of the human system, or anything remotely related to human nutrition in any way, which is why you should not be commenting publicly on that, Neil, in the same way that you are not an expert in climate change, and your comments on that particular area leave a lot to be desired as well, but that is for another day. Do make some progress, though, Neil. That's how much energy it has. No. Okay. No. So then you consume it. Yes, you consume mass, Neil, in the form of carbohydrates, fatty acids, amino acids, electrolytes, which are not really a nutrition thing, but they are still mass, and water, which also doesn't give you nutrition, but is mass. 
the things that change your mass on a scale upwards, Neil, by way of consuming things, so-called food consumption. I say so-called food because most people eat a diet that's nothing like food. That's the thing that changes your weight on the scale. No amount of photons with no rest mass, Neil, will change a person's weight on the scale perceptibly in any way, shape or form. And you know that, I think. So you do carry on, though. You need energy to live. That's a construct, Neil. And it's one that's widely accepted, so I don't blame you for saying that. However, it's not actually strictly correct, given that energy is a construct, i.e. the motive force to do work. And given that W equals FD, and D is relative to your inertial frame, whoops, we're, we're having a problem with external validity. Is there any such thing as external validity, Neil? Do we exist at all, given the point particle theory or the, or the, the quantum fields model of the universe? questionable, isn't it? We can't objectively prove that we do exist. Anyway, that's also for another day. What fun. Neil, carry on, please. To move, your heart beats. Actually, you don't need energy to move. You don't need energy to beat your heart. What you need is for your physical, mechanical structures of your body to work, do the work that they need to do. The fuel for that work is the, I'll call it reactive mass, the carbs, the proteins, the fats, sometimes alcohol, the things that provide so-called energy. No, actually what they're doing is they're providing the starting point for a series of chemical reactions wherein some energy is encapsulated along that process in such a way as to make it usable later, chemically stored energy. Okay, fine, fine, no problem with that. But at the end of the day, the energy thing remains a construct. If you accept that we exist objectively at all, the actual physical work being done is the measurable phenomenon. That is the first principle. And then explaining how that comes to pass is very much secondary to that, isn't it? Right, what's next? All this requires energy. You're getting it from the calories of the food you eat. Yeah, but you're not though. That's, that's not what you're actually doing at all. So what happens if you consume more calories than you need? Well. Several things can occur. Got to store that. Your net. body. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Tell you what, Neil, have you ever made a calories in, calories out calculation that involved the collection of your feces, the complete ignition of those feces in a bomb calorimeter to work out how many calories have actually been excreted through the anal orifice? Ever done that? No? No. Oh. Interesting. Body says... Store that. Store that energy. So it creates, it creates chemical potential energy in the form of fat. That's, but that's not chemical potential energy, Neil. Again, accepting objective reality is a thing. The thing that is observable, measurable, the thing that interacts with us as electromagnetic beings existing because of the Higgs field, that's the thing we see. It's mass, isn't it, Neil? In the form of mass, stored body fat. But there are many things that affect the balance of carriage of fat on a person's body or its eventual oxidation to provide the chemical required to facilitate, for example, the mechanical work of sliding filament theory for muscular contraction, one of the many forms of so-called energy drains in a human body. I hope this is going up some flagpoles. Um, what I'm basically saying for those who are still floundering as to, well, what's, what's this guy's problem? Well, I have many problems, but that's for another day. What I'm saying here is that this calories in, calories out idea is not just a bad piece of reductionism, which it is. It's a, it's a, it's a, it is a bad piece of reductionism, but it's not just that. This is not a semantic argument, as a lot of people have said. This is a very real practical utility statement. And it says this, there are processes outside of the intake of mass of food and physical work, metabolic work done by the body balance. There are factors outside of that which affect a person's fat carriage over time. The hormonal system, the endocrine system, the inflammasome, etc, 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 etc. Calories in, calories out is so inaccurate as an estimate as to be of no utility anyway and in fact using it for utility you have to undercut by 500 calories a day which is physiologically contraindicated for long-term health so forget it as utility even the way to set your metabolism up so that you do have the ideal fat carriage on your person is to eat a species appropriate species specific diet in terms 
of both the mass taken in and the makeup of that mass. All so-called food calories are not equal, Neil. You can vastly overeat so-called calories for several weeks on end and potentially end up weighing less than you did at the start. That does not fit within the umbrella of the calories in, calories out idea. It debunks it. It destroys it. We're done with it. It's a false idea. It's a false idol. It's a stupid piece of contraindicated bad advice based on really appalling reductionism and a fundamental lack of understanding of the first principles at hand. So that covers the argument itself. Now, comments directly for you, Neil. You are out of your lane here, well out of your lane. You are not a physiologist. You are not qualified in healthcare, nutrition, human physiology, or anything remotely similar to that. You do not understand the nuance. You, I suspect, believe that human beings are adherent to the first law of thermodynamics, which, Neil, they're not. The first law explicitly excludes open thermodynamic systems by its very formulation and its formalism. Please remain in your lane. Right, the rest of you, join me next time when someone else will be wrong on the interwebs, because there's a lot of that going around, isn't there?